the exoplanet science that we've done with Hubble was, was not even anticipated. This is an, a, a good example where we designed an instrument to do something. It was mostly extragalactic science, and then we realized that we could do something else. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, we're going to have some cool science. You may have heard that NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, their next flagship observatory after the Hubble, is now scheduled for launch on December 18th of 2021. This infrared observatory with a six and a half meter segmented deployable primary telescope will rocket off to a distant Lagrange point about a one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth, where it will deploy a tennis court sized multi-layer foil sun shield to allow it to cool to minus 223 degrees Celsius and observe the distant universe. The mission cost over $10 billion to put together. And on this episode, I'm going to be interviewing the Canadian uh, primary investigator for the Canadian contribution to the James Webb Space Telescope, Professor René Doyon. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please hit like, please share it with your friends, send me any comments you'd like uh, me to address. Thank you for listening. René Doyon obtained his PhD in astrophysics from the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine in 1990. He's a full professor at the physics department of the Université de Montréal, director of the Institute for Research on Exoplanets and the Momagantic Observatory. His research activities focus on the search and study of exoplanets, young stars, and the development of state-of-the-art astronomical instruments for ground and space-based observatories. He is the principal investigator of the Canadian built instrument on board the James Webb Space Telescope to be launched soon in 2021. His research team led the development of novel imaging techniques that contributed in 2008 to obtain the first images of a multiple planetary system outside the solar system. His distinctions include the 2009 Pollyanni Award and the prize from the American Association for the Advancement of Science and more recently, the 2018 Killam Research Fellowship. Professor Doyon, welcome to The Rational View. My pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Uh, this is gonna be fun. Uh, the science in the James Webb Space Telescope is really interesting. Can you give our listeners at first some background on your research program at Université de Montréal? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, my research is very much focused on development of uh, state-of-the-art in instruments, as you know, you know, telescopes in these instruments, and these instruments are very complex, and that's basically my my specialties. But also, I'm uh, I, I like to develop these instruments with a some some focus, some some scientific questions. I'm very much interested about exoplanets, so planet outside our own solar system, and uh, that's pretty much what I, what I do. I remember um, that first image of a extrasolar planet from your group, and back in I think it was 2009, we said. Uh, that was amazing. That was that was really cool. How did you do that? Well, it was a decade-long project. Uh, I mean, it all started in, in the middle of the, of the uh, 90s, and in fact, in 1995, with the first discovery of an exoplanet uh, around a, a, a solar-type stars. And at that time, uh, we started to dream of uh, trying to take pictures of these things. And at that time, it was uh, kind of impossible. But I mean, it's a long project that we, we've been going on with uh, graduate students, PhD students, and it, it, it took about a decade worth of effort. And at the end, it just pays off. There was, there was a little bit of luck. Uh, we found this incredible system. And uh, yeah, it was uh, really the, um, in, in this case, not really novel instrument, but novel ways of how to treat the data. Uh, that's another aspect about uh, 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 instrumentation development is not only the hardware, it's actually how you treat your, your, your data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was originally discovered, uh, gravita or the original planets were discovered by gravitational influence. They weren't imaged at first. People knew that there were these planets based on the gravitational shift of their central star, but they couldn't be imaged because the star is too bright and it drowns out uh, the light from the planets, right? 
Well, actually, in this specific case, we didn't know that there were planets around them. So we were looking for uh, the way to take images of, of a zone. You have to really uh, look for uh, um, young stars, and this, this star is only 60 million years old. And basically, we're looking for planet. When planet forms, initially, they are very, very warm, very, very hot, mm -hmm. something like a thousand Kelvin. And because they don't have any nuclear reactions in their core, they cool down with time. But uh, when they're, 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 they're young, they're, they glow very bright in the infrared. And this is when you can catch them. And so the strategy was to look for these young stars. So uh, again, we did not know there were planets around them. And in this specific system, uh, you know, initially we found three planets. That was a big surprise. Yes. And, uh, you know, our solar system is about twice as large as our solar system. And then later on, uh, uh, Christian Marwa, who was the, the domain discoverer of the, uh, of the system, uh, found a, a fourth planet uh, two years later on the system. So it's a very unique system. And in fact, we haven't found any uh, similar system uh, since then. Wow, that's cool. So I first got involved in the James Webb Space Telescope in the, in the late 90s with my colleague, uh, Dr. Neil Rowlands, when it was called uh, Next Generation Space Telescope as a follow-on to the Hubble. And we did several concept studies with the Canadian Space Agency on innovative scientific instruments that we hoped Canada would consider contributing. Do you tell our listeners your story of your involvement with James Webb? Well, it, it, it goes back to, uh, I mean, 20 years ago. Uh, in fact, this is uh, in 2001, the, the project was just started. And at that time, NASA was looking for, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who would build the instruments. And at that time, uh, the Canadian contributions was, was meant to be basically the fine gather system, not a science instrument, just the, the it's a very important system, the, the system that will actually guide the, the, uh, the telescope. And, um, and uh, but there was also a scientific contribution through the, the, uh, the US built instrument, the NIRCAM instrument, and that would, that would provide tunable filters, maybe a, a subsystem in, in the, of, the, of the US instrument to basically, uh, um, you know, focus very much on an extra science. And uh, the PI of, of, of the project, uh, Marsha Ricci, called me up in November 20, uh, 2001 and told me, well, Rene, I know you have expertise in infrared astronomy, and I, I would like you to, to lead the, uh, this, uh, the, the, the tunable filter inside near CAM. And at that time, um, yeah, your colleague, uh, Neil Rowland, was already involved. We were uh, thinking about an industry to do this. And so, yeah, it all started like this, like, like a, a phone call. At that time, I asked, okay, when, when is the telescope launch? Oh, 2008. Well, that's fine. That's, that's <laughs> long, but why not? Why not? So it all started that way. And of course, it's been a, a, a wonderful adventure uh, with uh, bumps and wiggles, but uh, we're finally there a few months away from launch. Indeed. So Canada, as you say, has a major contribution to the James Webb Space Telescope. NASA asked us to contribute the fine guidance sensor, which basically points the spacecraft and or points the um, the telescope and stabilizes the field of view to get really sharp images of, of very distant objects. Uh, as part of the work, you brought in the, the nearest instrument, which is the near infrared imaging and slitless spectrograph. Tell us about the capabilities of this instrument. Well, it's basically an instrument similar to the uh, the uh, the workhorse instrument near cam, which is a, an infrared camera. So an is, is basically an imager, can take pictures. But uh, we have uh, inside the instrument, we have uh, two wheels that we can insert optical element that can uh, do various things. Uh, not only, uh, in, we have grism. This is uh, something that can disperse light to do spectroscopy. So we have the capability to do uh, spectroscopy of all the objects in the field of view of the instrument. Mm -hmm. We have spectroscopy capability on board James Webb and the main instrument for that is near spec. And the most optimal way to do spectroscopy is that you have a slit that you isolate, you know, just take the light from a, a, an asymmetrical objects with nothing around and you disperse light. That's the most optimal way. But, and the, the limitation there is that you only limit it to a few objects. Near specs is a very complex machine that can take as much as 100 objects, 100 spectra at one time, but that, that's it. If you do slitless spectroscopy, in this case, you don't have any slits. You just take a, an image, you insert a, a dispersing element, and then you get spectra of everything in your field of view. So that way you, you can observe clusters of galaxies, for example, that uh, allows you to observe thousands of, of objects. 
with so, somewhat less sensitivity compared uh, to a slit spectrograph, but it's highly complementary. So uh, that's one thing. And uh, NIRIS also has an observing mode that was specifically designed to look at, uh, to study uh, exoplanet atmospheres. So we're very excited about atmosphere, uh, exoplanet. We know that there are more than 4,000 of those. And the next big thing about exoplanet is to study the atmospheres. And we do it uh, on a special class of exoplanet, those that happens to transit in front of their star. Um, so, um, uh, you know, and when the, the planet uh, goes in front of the star, there's a little dip of light, uh, but there's also an, an atmosphere. And by comparing the spectrum you get, you get before and during transit, then you can you, you get a, a, a net spectrum of the atmosphere. And that's uh, very difficult to do, but that's basically the way you can determine whether this planet has uh, the, uh, this water, uh, methane, CO2. That's ultimately, you know, a, a, a very powerful technique to, to have um, habitable planets. Wow. So yeah, NIRIS was optimized for this. And there's, there's many other things too. Um, so we're looking at a planet that goes in front of its star and you're actually m measuring the change. So you, you can't really resolve it with, with NIRIS. You can't resolve the planet, but you see a point of light, which is this star with a planet in front of it. And the spectrum changes when that planet goes in front of the star, just fractionally because of the light shining through that planet's atmosphere. And we're going to use NIRIS to measure the spectrum of that atmosphere. And what are we hoping to detect? Well, um, water, that's the big the molecule that, you know, uh, that, that's the molecule of life, but we, uh, we are sensitive also to detect methane, CO, CO2. So all the building blocks of uh, life. Uh, wow. Uh, of course, oxygen is, is one that we'd like to do. That one is mu it's much more difficult though. Uh, and, and NIRIS is not going to be very sensitive to that. But there's other instrument on board where MIRI who actually could detect uh, potentially ozone uh, uh, at in around nine, nine micron. So in okay. fact, all science instruments on James, on James Webb will have capability to look at uh, exoplanet atmospheres and, and they're all complementary with one another. What, what is unique about NIRIS is that it can observe fairly bright stars. Uh, you know, initially, uh, you mentioned NGST was the next generation space telescope. It used to be called the first light machine, an instrument really designed to look at, at you know, at galaxies, very faint things. And it was, mm. uh, but later we realized that we could uh, also observe exoplanets, but those are bright stars and they are very difficult. So uh, we had to design NIRIS in a way that we can disperse light so that we can observe bright stars. Um, so th those are very challenging observations. So Obviously, this has taken 20 years from conception to to launch. How has the, the, the science case changed over the years? Obviously, as you say, it was first uh, look, the idea was to look at the first galaxies after the Big Bang and try to detect these dim galaxies, which is why it was in the infrared, because the light from these uh, ultraviolet star forming regions has been red shifted by the expansion of the universe into the infrared spectrum. And so it's ideally designed to detect these early galaxies. So, so you're saying that the science case has now shifted to focus on exoplanets or, or what, what are the, the main changes over this 20 year period? I mean, it's, it must be fabulous. Yeah, so the, the, the main science case of JWST to look at the, uh, the first light, you know, the, the, the very first galaxies that, that, that uh, light up, uh, we think about, about 400 million after the Big Bang. That science case has not changed. Of course, there's been lots of discovery about, about the early universe with, with Hubble, but Hubble has, has, has some fundamental uh, limitation, as, as you mentioned, because of the expansion of the universe, these uh, young galaxies are shining very bright in the ultraviolet spectrum, but that spectrum is shifted in, into the infrared. But Hubble was an optical instrument, or well, is an optical instrument, and so there's a, a fundamental limit. At some point, you know, uh, Webb, uh, not Webb, but HST is, is blind. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that science case has not changed, and this, this, it, it is still relevant. What has changed a lot is on the exoplanet science. Uh, as I mentioned, I, st this, I started in this project in 2001. Well, 2000, 2000 is the, 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 the year, the first discovery of a transiting planet. The first one was discovered in, 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 in 2000. And now the vast majority of exoplanets were found through the transit technique, thanks to missions like Kepler and now mm -hmm. TESS. Ground. So this field, this field has ex expanded incredibly uh, a lot. And, um, and we realized that the instrument we were building for JWST could also be, be, be used for, uh, for other things. 
And so we've done some minor changes to the instrument that, that most of them did not change all that much. MIRI, NIRCAM, NIRSPEC did not change very much. But NIRIS is one that came more late in, in the game, in, in the late uh, 2000, 2009 roughly. And um, for a number of reasons, we reconfigured the, the instrument we were building. And so, but yeah, we, we had a, an opportunity at that time to actually build an instrument that would be specifically designed uh, at least for one of the observing mode to look at exoplanet atmospheres. That's, uh, we now ant anticipate that about a quarter, if not more, of the observing time on web will be dedicated to exoplanets. Wow, okay, that's great. And as you say, this is something that, this is a field of science that just didn't exist. I remember back last millennium where we didn't even know there were planets around other stars or not. <laughs> exactly. It's amazing how, how quickly the field has moved and it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. I, I I can't wait to see. So, can you contrast maybe the capabilities of JWST with with HST, which is what most people are recognized? I mean, this is a much yeah. bigger thing, right? Yeah, just to, to, you know, HST is it's a two point four meter telescope uh, operating in the optical. We now have infrared detectors on board the uh, uh, HST, but the orbit of HST is not optimized. If you want to, if you want to do uh, in fred astronomy, uh, you really have to have to, have it to, to be in a cold environment. So you have to think about uh, in fred like uh, uh, in the infrared, your telescope itself is shining. The sky is shining very bright, so you need to to be in a very dark environment and cold environment. This is why we're sending web far away from the Earth, at 1.5 million kilometers, and always in the shadow of 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 of, of um, uh, behind a, a sun shield. Um, so. Um, Sorry, I, I, I miss. I, I, no, that's I a good point. I, I just want to yeah. focus a little bit on that because uh, in the infrared, um, object warm objects actually emit infrared light because they're warm. So to get a good signal to noise, to get rid of the background, you have to cool the telescope. And, and, and JWST is cooled to something like 40 Kelvin or 50 Kelvin uh, so that it's very cold. And the engineering yes. challenge of building these instruments in a room temperature building a telescope at room temperature and having it work when it's cooled to minus 223 degrees uh, is 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 daunting and that's one of the reasons uh, this has taken so long to test and demonstrate and put together it's exactly the, the the cryogenic aspect of GWST is one of the most complex aspect and uh but it's fundamental we need to not only to cool the detector that detect this in the lights but we need to to cool everything uh, to, to maximize our, our, our sensitivity. And most um, people would say that, you know, space is cold. Why is this a problem? This, why is this difficult? But the fact is that we've got to be generating electricity energy with solar panels on this thing and, and using this energy. And it's, the problem is dissipating the heat when you don't have anything to dissipate to. You have to basically radiate all your heat off into space with well-positioned radiators and, and protect this thing from the sun because the sun will heat things up in space. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Webb is protected by this huge sun shield the size of a tennis court, but on the warm side, it's something like 80 Celsius. But on, on the cold side, as you mentioned, it's, it's 40 Kelvin, uh, so very, 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 very cold. And that brings a lot of challenges in terms of uh, not only building these things to have things that can work at these temperatures, but also to test them. Um, uh, as you probably know, the whole telescope was tested and tested in, in, in huge uh, 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 chambers to, to, to test that, you know, it, 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 it operates well at, at, at this temperature. But to come back to your question about uh, how, how Devon is HST and, 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 uh, and, and Hubble and, and Webb, uh, well, first of all, for example, the, the exoplanet science that we've done with Hubble was, was not even anticipated. This is an, a good example where we designed an instrument to do something. It was mostly extragalactic science and then we realized that we could do something else. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we were quite surprised to see Hubble making these uh, uh, observations of uh, exoplanet atmospheres. We've started doing that with, 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 Webb, with, with Hubble, sorry, uh, observing exoplanet atmospheres. We've detected water. Uh, one of my colleagues at University of Montreal, Bjorn Benecke, recently uh, made a really important observations on the, a, a mini Neptune. It's not a, a rocky planet, but it's something that is, uh, you know, in between the Earth and Neptune, hmm. and that sits right in the habitable zone of, of, of its star. And he discovered water in the atmosphere of, of this planet, and also probably clouds, which suggests there's probably you know liquid water uh, wow. raining on, 
on the system. So already HST is making huge contribution. But one issue with, with uh, HST is that their instrument w were not designed to do the science. And so for example, the, the wavelength range that they have is quite narrow. And so we want to be able to observe over much wider wavelength range. And this is what uh, uh, Web and NIRIS in particular will be capable of. And not only that, but uh, it, these observations are very delicate. You know, I, as, you, as you mentioned, we're talking about, you know, detecting the light that goes through a tiny sliver of, 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 uh, of an atmosphere. And for that, you need a big aperture. You need a, a large collecting area like, like, like uh, Webb, which will be 6.5 meters. So about five times more than, 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 than HST. So this, this will be a major uh, game changer for exoplanet science. Yeah, it's amazing to think of the size of the telescope. It's six and a half meters, and it's a segmented array of, of one and a half meter um, telescopes, basically, that all have to be aligned to extreme precision, to fractions of a wavelength in terms of their positioning to actually end up with a good image. And this is deployable. They, have, they fold it up to fit inside a rocket fairing, and then it gets out into space and it unfolds and it has to align itself. That, that scares the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a, a major part of the, the development. Uh, well, for example, segmented telescopes are, are around for, for a while. I mean, they were uh, first on the on the Keck telescope on the ground, the, the 10 meter telescope, which was a major revolution. That was the way to go to large uh, aperture. And that was, uh, you know, eight meter was kind of a limit to do a monolithic mirror. Hmm. And when you think of space, uh, well, the segmented uh, architecture allows you to fold things up. So uh, as you mentioned, there's 18 segments uh, on, 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 on web and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the, and, and the, uh, the other six uh, uh, segments can be folded to, because as you mentioned, we need to put this huge telescope into a, a frame of a rocket and we don't have uh, a big rocket. So we, the, the whole telescope is folded into a figure of a, like an, an origami figure. And, and as you mentioned, these mirrors, not only they need to be polished to very high accuracy, they need to be aligned with one another to a fraction of a, of a wavelength, namely micron. So, you know, just to give you an idea, a human air is about 50 micron. So we're, we have to, 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 to align this scale to a, a much, fra a much a, 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 maybe a tenth of, 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 a, of, a, of a human air, even less than that. Wow. And the way to do is, is that each mirror they have actuators underneath seven actuators that you can we can tip them uh, uh change the piston even change the radius of regard uh, of curvature slightly and so there were lots of um, prototype uh done uh scale down prototypes to, to to see how we would do this alignment and it, this is now pretty much pretty, pretty well done we we know how to do this and we've rehearsed that a lot and, uh, and a key component of this whole system is the Canadian Build Instrument, which will be the very, very first one to take these images. The very first image that Webb will have will not be a nice point light, will be 18 little images because initially the mirrors won't be aligned properly and the, the Canadian Instrument will be quite critical in this, in this alignment process. So we're working as a, like a wavefront sensor to, to help align these telescopes? Yeah, the, the main wavefront sensor is within NIRCAM, but initially we need to, to capture these images and also we need, we need to guide, um, you know, the, the, the Canadian instrument is basically two instruments in one box. We have, we talked about NIRIS, which is the, the, the science instrument, but on the other side, we, we have the guider. And that one is actually a critical subsystem. We need to, uh, it, it, it can guide the, the, uh, the, the telescope with exquisite accuracy. This is probably the best guiding system ever built. In, 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 in civil system. I don't know about the, the, the military, but just to give you an idea, uh, uh, the, the FGS, the fine guidance sensor, can actually detect the movement equivalent of the, the thickness of a human hair at two kilometers. That's how accurate we have to, 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 to compensate for the vibration of the telescope to keep the images very, very sharp. Wow. And the initial process of aligning the, the mirrors uh, will need a guider to do this. And it's it's quite a, a mark of distinction that NASA asked Canada to, to uh, produce that and, and hang their hat on basically to make this whole system work. This is a, a $10 billion mission uh, for, for NASA, uh, more than $10 billion if you include all the partner contributions, the, the European Space Agency's MIRI instrument and the, the NIRSPEC and the NIRIS. Um, 
The Canadian contribution cost over $150 million for our instrument. And for this, Canadian astronomers are going to receive guaranteed observation time on JWST uh, plus 5% of guest observer time. This seems like a pretty good value for the ratio of costs. <laughs> it is a pretty good deal, yes. Um, well, initially, the, the, the cost of the, of the telescope was much less than that. And uh, we were in this area of, uh, you know, the Dan Goldie in the NASA administrator at that time was, uh, you know, uh, the, its model was uh, cheaper, uh, cheaper, faster and better. Um, uh, of course, um, you know, things got more expensive. It's basically because this is for the very first time we do a, a telescope of that, of, of, of that complexity. And it's a very important uh, milestone because, uh, you know, already we're thinking of the, ne the, fu the, the next future big telescope and they have architecture, at least some of them have architecture very similar to, to Webb. And so the, the success of Webb will be absolutely critical for building new new, new telescope in the, in the future. But, but you're right about the Canadian contribution. I like to think we have a pretty good deal. Yeah, you know, that seems seems very good. Uh, I mean, I'm sure many people would question such a large investment in astronomy. Do you think it's it's worth it? Obviously, you say that there's there's spin-off technology that's going to come out of this that's being useful for other things. Can you tell us anything about, you know, where the technology is going and 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 what it's being used for? Yeah, I mean, Webb Webb has been a a, a telescope where we have to uh invent new things and then the very one obvious is are the the detectors the infrared detectors they were largely developed for uh, for for jwsd and um it's difficult to predict how these technology influence our our day-to-day -day life but uh, historically uh, uh history shows that the the they, they're huge impact i'll give you the the best example is there are the you know the well the ccd the little chip in in any and everyone's cell phone the, uh, these chips uh, did not exist in the early uh, 70s, but they were largely developed by astronomers to equip, uh, you know, HST at that time was called LST, the Large Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these technology was largely developed uh, with astronomy as the main driver. And later on, we realized, oh, geez, well, we can do more than just uh, studying the universe with these textures. We can. Uh, you know, uh, make uh, 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 images, and it's now in the uh, uh, bio. Um, uh, you, you can do bio imaging. Look, this, this, the, no one anticipated the the impact of this technology, and yet they they, they, they came from uh, from astronomy. So that's one example. Um, and now infrared uh, technologies are absolutely crucial for uh, uh, Earth uh, uh, um, uh, uh, detections, and uh, and so uh, yeah, these things are actually crucial and. One last to th to put things in perspective. Yeah, ten billion dollars is a lot of money, but compared to the the global economy uh, involving uh, uh, U.S., Canada, Europe, um, or spread over twenty years, it's not a lot of money. It's this we're we're spending a lot more money in in, in many other things, and so uh, the uh, I think the return on the investment is way 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 um, uh, it, it's quite a lot, quite a lot. So a timeline of over twenty years that does spread it out. And now all our eggs are in one launch basket, as it were, uh, scheduled for December 18th. Uh, are you nervous? Not really. Um, no, I, well, maybe I will <laughs> on the launch pad when it, when it happens, but for now, no, I, I feel very confident um, um, because, you know, we never compromise risks and this is all about testing and retesting and checking everything. Um, no, I'm very confident that this will work. Um, uh, NASA and the whole space industry, worldwide, uh, Canada, Europe, uh, have, have good track records. And mm -hmm. so we have good reasons to, uh, to be confident. It's, uh, it's, 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 you know, we, we have a great team. Uh, this, the, the Canadian Contribution is the results of, of course, CSA providing the, the funding, but uh, academia and not least industry um, I mean, you were involved in that too, uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, it, it's a good teamwork, and I, 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 I'm, I'm very confident that this will this, this, this will be okay. Yeah, you mentioned the testing. This this is probably one of the most extensively tested instruments ever to go uh, into space. We we delivered the fine guidance sensor nearest to NASA to start testing back in 2012. 
when when the U.S. Congress was thinking maybe they should cancel the whole program because it was going over budget, but we were done. It's like you can't yeah. cancel it now. We're done. But they they had yeah. you know eight years of testing before they got this thing ready to go. So it was. Yeah, is it? yeah I mean every project of this scale goes goes to some some crisis and of course web was uh, was certainly one of them as you mentioned uh, in, in, in 2012 there was a, uh, a crisis uh, you know the the, the cost growth of, of, of the telescope and uh, there was a threat of uh, canceling the, the missions but at the end uh, I think NASA realized that you know they just couldn't kill this thing especially because this is a, an international project it would have been quite difficult to do this and um, and you know uh, we got delays and uh, and but uh, we're finally there. Uh, we're at the end of the runway and uh, we're just about to to launch. It's exciting. No, well, that that sounds great. I hope uh, things go well. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing the first images from James Webb at its Lagrange. Wait, how long does it take uh, from launch to to first images? It's it's got to spiral out to the Lagrange point. So when what's the timeline once it's launched to get science going? Well, first we have uh, about 14 days of deployment. So this this complex uh, uh, structure needs to be deployed. So this will take uh, about uh, uh, two weeks, and then uh, 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 another two weeks to actually get to 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 L2. So at that point, we're basically going around the uh, second point of Lagrange, and and now the instrument is cooling down. The whole telescope is cooling down. But after after a month, we're starting to to take uh, data. With the uh, the observatory, and so there will be uh, six months of commissioning of, of basically uh, exercising the instrument, checking that everything is, works as expected. So we have a long list of things to do. Um, the uh, the science instrument will be commissioned mostly towards the end of, of this period, in, in, in month five. Uh, so this will be a very very busy time for uh, all science instruments, including NERIS, where we're going to have we're going to be prime for maybe three or four four weeks of. Uh, Continuous tests, uh, 24/7, uh, and um, and this thing has been rehearsed and rehearsed. It's not like we're going to be doing that for the first time. We've, there's been lots of rehearsal exercise, and uh, in the control room in Baltimore, uh, the the headquarters of the uh, of, of the operations, uh, to make sure that um, you know we're ready and uh, and we're still do, doing that. There's an, uh, what we call uh, LRE six next October, uh, called a launch rehearsal exercise. So this will, this will be the sixth one, the last one, uh, before launch to make sure everything is in place and we uh, we know um, how, how to do things. Uh, very complex operation. I'm glad we're doing all this testing. I know we've learned a lot of lessons from Hubble, which was launched with an with a error in its primary mirror. Because <laughs> yes. it'd be faster, better, cheaper. <laughs> Worked out to be faster and cheaper, but maybe not better. <laughs> So yeah, and Hubble, that, it yeah, was fixed, was right? Effective. It was fixed by sending up astronauts, and and you know they sent new instruments with corrected optics to fix the primary. The primary has always been out of focus exactly. for Hubble. You can't yeah, do that with so James. Mirror, uh, no, exactly. So Hubble had a a perfectly wrong mirror. It was a <laughs> you know, one, one of the best uh, mirror ever polished, uh, but it, it had a, a systematic error in, in in its curvature, and that created you know bad images, fake collaborations. That we realize very very soon. Uh, the good news is that because Hubble is just in low orbit, 500 kilometers, and uh, launched by the, the space shuttle, you could go back there and you know change one of the instrument uh, uh, to to fix it. Um, uh, and you know that 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 has been the, the the main success story of Hubble being able to to change this instrument. You know, typically, the lifetime of an instrument on, on Hubble is about five years. So that's uh, for for Webb. All the instruments are, are designed to last at least five years, but they've been tested, they've been designed and tested to last 10 years. There's, there's enough fuel inside the, 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 the telescope to operate for about 11 years. Uh, so hopefully we'll, 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 we'll go that long, but we have a good at least five years before with all four science instruments. After that, well, you can expect some failure, but there's lots of uh, redundancy in all, uh, in, in, in all instruments, but most of them actually. That's interesting because yeah, Hubble has it has lasted well beyond its design life due to you know it's had several instrument upgrades uh, brought up by the sh the space shuttle back back in the days when there was a space shuttle operating. Uh, yes. It's it's 
it's been an amazing instrument. It's got so much scientific uh, punch out of it because it's been able to be updated as the science progresses. Uh, James Webb, we need to make this thing work for as long as it can. What what happens at the end of, of James Webb? It runs out of fuel. Is it is it done at that point, or can you still use it? Um, it, it's a good question. The, the the issue is that we won't be able to. Uh, we we need some fuel to 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 point a telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, there, there's some reaction wheels inside that, the, but we can, we still need some fuel to uh, to dump some momentum. You know, this this huge tennis court. Uh, uh, it's like a sail, and the, the solar pressure is more, is 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 is, is exerting some pressure, and so um, it would be difficult to operate a telescope beyond uh, this uh, eleven years. Uh, but uh, who knows? I mean, uh, you know, we 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 we've, we've seen how clever we can be. Uh, the 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 Kepler mission, uh, an exoplanet mission that uh, uh, lasted four years, and uh, it, you know, after four years, the telescope lost two reaction wheels, and engineer learned how to operate the telescope using. Uh, solar panel uh, uh, through the, the uh, solar pressure, and so the, one could extend the mission uh, for some while. But for Webb, um, in fact, people haven't really thought about that yet. But uh, I think in terms of power, there will still be power going into the observatory through the solar panels mm -hmm. unless they fail. Uh, but yeah, whether we can operate without fuel, that's probably a long shot. Yeah. Wow. Well, well I guess we'll have to start. Based on that timeline, we should have started working on the on the follow-on ten years ago. What's next after yeah, James well, Webb? Once once this probably, goes up, are you yeah. going to be building us another telescope, Renee? Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be beyond my horizon personally. Uh, but I mean, but these projects are already on 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 the blackboard. Uh, and there's a there's a concept called a Louvoir, which is a, a telescope that could be as as big as fifteen meters, very similar to. To web, except that this one would be uh, a warm telescope uh, operating mostly in the optical and uh, a little bit in the infrared, uh, with one of its mission to actually uh, detect biosignatures. You know, being capable uh, not only to take images uh, like we've done uh, a decade ago, but to take spectra of those and really uh, detect um, oxygen. And uh, it's 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 a mission that is uh, in the planning. There, the U.S. Decadal Review is this, this panel that uh, set the priority of the uh, U.S. astronomy for the next decade. It's just about to issue a report where they will, you know, uh, decide on whether these missions will, will, will whether we'll start seriously on these missions. But there's many other competing uh, projects, so uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting time. But this this decade will be, uh, uh, you know, dominated by James Webb in space. There's no doubt about that. And then with the launch uh, uh, in a few months. Oh, I hope so. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining me here. I've got maybe one final question for you. Um, I've managed to score an interview with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson coming up uh, very soon. Are there any questions you'd like me to ask him? Well, I'm just curious about how excited he is about James Webb and whether he's, uh, he's skeptical about the, the whole tel the whole thing. You know, the, there's a lot of skepticism, skepticism out there because it's such a complex telescope. Oh, it will never work. And uh, I'm just curious to see what's his feeling in, uh, uh, about uh, uh, about this, this this project. I'm sure he's very excited. I mean, he's a, he's a science guy. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, definitely, uh, I'll definitely pigeonhole him on that. That's I want to get his opinion. So thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing your, your work with, uh, with our listeners. Uh, appreciate it very much. My pleasure, Al. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page, at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.